All right, keep on trucking along here. So Abram goes back to where he first, in, or in Canaan, first encountered God and built that altar. Um, and, but there's obviously this need for Abram and Lot to separate, and I believe that's entirely by God's providential design and purpose to get Abram and Lot. He, he, Abram did, or God did not want Abram in any way thinking that his brother's son, his nephew, would be an heir under his household. Okay? This was not a promise for Lot. While there's nothing wrong with Lot, the promise was to Abram and his descendants that they would be the ones who would inherit the land of Canaan and through whom all of those promises that would lead to the Messiah and salvation would come. And so God has very clear purposes in what we're seeing happen here. So while Lot was a close family member of Abram, they had been, and they've been traveling together since they departed Haran, but that we, we see that the two men had substantial and growing possessions that were now causing conflict. And the land, and the reason for the conflict was the land was not able to support and provide for all the resources that they would need. Again, we don't know if the famine was still strong in the land or not, but uh, they definitely needed resources, and the land was apparently sufficient for one of the two of them to stay in, but not the other. Okay. So, uh, and this is made known because of the herdsmen of Abram and Lot were in a regular struggle for these resources between themselves, and that doesn't even include the fact that the Canaanites and the Perizzites were in the land, and if there's still any remnants of the famine going on, they all need resources, and it just wasn't enough for them. And that, again, is by God's design. So Abram sought to end the strife between the two servants. He wants a, a very amicable division or separation between him and his nephew, doesn't want any strife, and so rather than letting it blow up into something huge, Abram makes a wise decision, godly choice here, and that is to, um, to suggest that these two families and all of that they had in their um, possession need to separate into different areas or regions of the, of the world. So it's clear that Abram and Lot would need to separate. Uh, Abram and the two men need to separate in order for them to care for all this vast amount of possessions, the weight, the burden of their possessions. So Abram gave Lot the choice. This is, uh, this is, I believe, you know, something that's magnanimous, but also an act of faith. So Abram gives Lot the choice of lands. He saw, he said, you go left, I'll go right. I, I don't ever want to hear, Lot, that I took the better choice, right? That I was the one who made the choice. So um, he, he shows, I believe, in his own heart and with his nephew, that he has both the favor with God and faith that it doesn't matter where you, what, what, which way you go, Lot, because God's going to bless me either way. I don't need the, what seems to the eye to be the best land. I know that God will provide for me. I think he's already learning and passing the test a little bit better now. Okay. So he wanted his nephew to pick the best land, um, and he got, Abram t trusted Yahweh to provide for his every need. He's no, no longer concerned about the famine, no longer concerned about uh, other issues in his life. So he's starting to pass a couple of tests. So Lot used his eyes to determine which direction was best for him. And by using his eyes, he selected the plain of the Jordan plain in the east, which looked like to him, to his eyes, like it may have been like the Garden of Eden. Okay, not quite that level of, of lush and, and productivity, but he looked at it and thought, this, this is like, almost like the garden that I've heard my you know, ancestors, Adam and Eve, lived in. Um, and so he, he takes that choice. wasn't the best moral choice, as we'll see with Sodom and Gomorrah down the road, but he chose a land that visually looked good to him. So Lot's decision to go east kept Abram right where God had previously instructed him to dwell. Isn't that great? God says, go to the land of Canaan, and Abram says, you know, Lot, you go whichever direction you want. I'll go a different direction so we're not competing. Lot makes a choice by his own free will, but in making that free will decision, guess what? Abram ends up right where God called him earlier in his life to live as the land of Canaan. 
So while Lot was given preference and the freedom to choose, his future des- uh, descendants would... Dis- yeah. So the, uh, Lot goes and he chooses this land off in the Jordan Plain, but his future descendants, you know, descendants of Lot, would dispute the land with Abraham, and they actually still are, right? They're still uh, disputing land, land and territory judgments. And so even though Abram was magnanimous and he was gracious and he said, Lot, you just pick. And Lot left behind the land of Canaan, the promised land, the land of Israel, the land of Palestine, as we uh, have to call it today, or some people call it today, um, is still under dispute by the very same kind of people. Lot and uh, Ishmael and and, uh, and, uh, and Esau and the rest of them, right, still disputing the land. Lot, of course, though, had no idea what his future in the Jordan Plains would entail, But Moses inserts, Moses, not Abram, Moses here, the writer of Genesis, inserts a commentary that we recognize a very big destruction is coming for Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness. So Lot made the choice. Uh, Abram tells his readers, all of us, that uh, that choice would end up in destruction for Lot, and not Lot being destroyed, but the destruction of his, uh, his, his territories that he lived in because of great wickedness that was occurring there. Okay, so let's move forward now into uh, chapter 13, starting in verse 14. So this is after the separation. And, and we're going to see uh, Yahweh making land grant promises to Abram. So in verse 14, Genesis 13, And Yahweh said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants could also be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And he built an altar there to the Lord. Okay. So um, we're going to see this is, this is the first of multiple uh, affirmations of the, what we call the Abrahamic covenant. This one has to do in generic terms with the basic plot of real estate we would call Canaan or now Israel at the time. Okay. So as I mentioned already, God clearly used the strife between the two men's herdsmen to move Lot away from Abram to, make, uh, to begin making his land grant to be exclusive to Abraham and Abraham only, or Abraham and Abraham's direct descendants only. Abraham had yet to do anything that we can see in the text worthy of receiving God's promise like this and the blessings that he's received. Okay. But God is going to offer him, not by works, not by uh, anything other than he's offered a blessing to Abram. All Abram has to do is be willing to receive it. So God offered all of his promises by grace, not by works. It's not working for this. It's a blessing from God. All Abraham had to do was have faith, and he did. So then Yahweh instructs Abram to lift up his eyes from within the heart, right here, you know, we're in the terebinth trees of Mamre, right? He looks in the heart of Canaan, and he says, look as far as your eye could see in any direction, and that's what I'm giving you as land. Now, he's going to be more specific in chapter 15, uh, but... Uh, but for now, it's like, you know, Abraham, just take a look, and you can walk the length and the breadth of the land that we're in, and everything you see, I'm giving to you as an inheritance. And your descendants, really, it's your descendants after you. <laughs> Abraham, uh, the only thing Abraham ever, Abram, Abraham ever owned in his entire existence in Canaan was the burial plot for his wife, Sarai. Right? He never had anything more than that as a title deed to any part of the land. But God is promising he will give it to his descendants, who he doesn't even have at this stage. He's going to give the descendants the land. So Yahweh also promised Abram that he would have an innumerable number of descendants, even though at this moment he doesn't even have one son. 
He's got none, and he says, your, your descendants are going to be innumerable. Can you imagine at age 75 being told your descendants will be more numerable or as num- so numerable that you can't, if you can't count the dust of the earth, then you can't count the number of descendants you're ever going to have. Okay. Um, and so what a promise. And, and can you imagine believing that promise with all faith at his age and in the condition that they were in at that time? So Abram's descendants would be just as uncountable as the dust particles covering the earth, meaning this is not to say that if if there's, you know, quadrillion uh, dust particles on the earth, that that's the number of descendants Abram would have. The statement is just as, as impossible or incomprehensible as counting the dust of the ground it, you can't really count the number of descendants you're ever going to have. Okay? So it's not an e- equal number. It's just the, the, it's an impossible task. He could never count, count them, and he never can count his, all of his descendants. So Yahweh instructed Abram to walk throughout the whole territory, to observe all that Yahweh had given to him, and not just for the moment. He, gave, he says, I'm giving it to you forever. Uh, this likely put the inhabitants of the land on notice that Yahweh would be bringing a new people group in to replace them in the lands, right? So Abram is getting this promise, whether it was secret or known in his territory, I think Yahweh is make, you know, making a declaration. Certainly, as Moses is writing this to the generation of people coming out of Egypt, that are going to possess the land or the next generation after them, there's notice here, that's God's land, and he's giving it to Abraham, he's giving it to Abram's descendants forever, and so the people in the land are on notice that you can't live here forever. It's God's people who will inherit it, um, not the Canaanites. So with Yahweh's instructions and promises confirmed, Abram moved his tent to the terebinth trees of Mamre in Hebron, which is, if you're not familiar with that, I don't have it on the map, but uh, located 20 miles southwest of Jerusalem. So you can kind of picture that. The place where this, now it's an interesting place, okay? Uh, This uh, Hebron is an interesting place. It's a place where Sarah will later die in the narrative when she finally dies. Um, It's a place where Caleb was given land because of he was a faithful spy when he went in under Moses, right? Moses or or Caleb and Joshua go in to spy out the land, and they're the faithful ones. Uh, Later, it became one of the six Levitical cities of refuge. Remember, there was these six cities of refuge, three on the east of the Jordan and three on the west, and it was one of those cities. So Hebron became one of the cities of refuge in the territory. Um, and later, David, the king, would make Hebron his capital city for those first seven years when he was king over Judah, but not king over the whole of the 12 tribes of Israel. So it's got a lot of, you know, uh, meaningful events that take place in Hebron later in the text. All right, but that's mostly narrative, so let's move on to the next phase. So now we're in chapter 14. Um, this is basically the battle as it's described as the Battle of the Nine Kings. And I'm going to read uh, this section or these sections, uh, and I, you'll notice the very last point on your notes there is I'm not going to talk about Melchizedek. There's way too much to talk about with Melchizedek, so I'm not going to cover the Melchizedek encounter with Abram, but we'll cover everything else that happened in chapter 14. Okay. So these chapters are fairly short, but anyway, chapter 14, verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Arafel king of Shinar, that's remember where they came down, Shinar, the Tower of Babel, and all of that, right? In the days of uh, Shinar, Arioch, king of Elasar, the Ketel, Keterleomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that they made war with Bera, the king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adama, Shimem, Shimeber, <laughs> Shimeber, king of Zeboim, and king, the king of Bela, that is, of Zoar. All these joined together in the valley of Siddim, that is, in the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Keterleomer, and the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Keterleomer and the kings that were with him and atta- uh, came with him and attacked the Rephaim and the Ashtaroth and the Kernim and the Zuzim, in Ham, and in Emim, and Shaveh, and Kirathiam. 
somewhere in there. And the Horites in their mountains of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to In Mishpat, that is in Kadesh, and attacked all of the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who dwelt in at, at, uh, Hazazon Tamar. And the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adama, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Siddim against Keterleomer, the king of Elam, titled the king of nations, Arafel, the king of Shinar, and Ariot, king of Elisar. Four kings against five. That's, you don't have to remember all those names, just remember four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, all their provisions, and they went their way. And they also took Lot. Now we're getting to why we're encountering this account, right? And they also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and he departed. Then the one who had escaped, then one who had escaped, came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by, uh, dwelt by the terebent trees of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eshcol and the brother of Aner, and they were allies with Abram. Now, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed 318 trained servants who were born in his own house, and he went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Keterleomer and the kings who were with him. Now I'm going to jump past the Melchizedek and, and just finish off this account here. Okay. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to Yahweh, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abraham rich. Except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the, of, of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, uh, and let them take their portion. Okay. So, that's basically chapter 14. It's the battle of the nine kings. Okay? Um, and obviously, Lot being taken captive is the main component of that. And the main reason to, the whole story or the whole account is given to us is so that Abram could have an encounter with, with Melchizedek, who I've got much to say and will never fit it into tonight. So we're just going to, again, talk about this whole battle, multiple battles that were going on here. So it occurred in the days of Amraphel, the king of Shinar, which would be about 1985 B.C., just to put us into B.C. timeline perspective. I base that based on Abram's age. You know, he moved from Haran to Canaan in age 75, and he's not much older than that yet. He hasn't even had uh, the experience of bringing um, Ishmael into, into being born. And so it's somewhere in a five to eight year period here between age 75 and 83 or something like that. Okay, so then uh, the kings of Mesopotamia, just, so Mesopotamia, that's, you know, um, Shinar, that's Ur of the Chaldeans, that's down south where we saw the Tower of Babel being built, all of that stuff. So we have these five kings of Mesopotamia, form, or, or four of them, I guess, four, uh, four, uh, from Mesopotamia form an alliance. Uh, and he tells us uh, their names, Amraphel, the king of Shinar, Ariok, uh, Ariok the king of Eleazar. Ketelaomer, the king of Elam, and Tidal, the king of nations, or, which was the king of the Goyim, uh, the king of the people, okay, king of nations. 
So th these four kings have formed an alliance, and they, they desire territory and enslavement of the people who live north of them in the Jordan Plain. Okay. So the kings of the Jordanian plains formed an alliance to repel the Mesopotamian alliance, right? So there's four kings in the south from Mesopotamia. They want to come up north to the Jordan River just on the other side of Jerusalem or, or land of Canaan and where Lot had moved. And so these five kings are in an alliance trying to preserve and protect their own territory and people, okay? Bera, the king of Sodom, Bersha, the king of Gomorrah, Shinab, the king of Adama, uh, Shemember, the king of Zeboim, and some unnamed king. Why he didn't get a name, I have no idea. Some, uh, the king of Bela, which is Zoar, but we don't know why he doesn't have a name given to us in the scripture. At least I don't. So the kings of Mesopotamia made war against these Jordanian kings, you know, near the Salt Sea, near the Dead Sea, and forced them into bondage for 12 years. So this has happened well before Abram is in this part of the world. Okay? They're in this bondage in, uh, under the kings of the Mesopotamia you know, alliance. And so they forced them under, in, into bondage for 12 years under Keterleomer's rule. He's the, he's the chief you know, of the alliance. So um, again, uh, first mentions. So here's some first mentions for us in, in Genesis. It's so the first mention of kings. First time we've ever seen the word king in Scripture, okay, as far as in the historical narrative of Genesis, or even rulers. Now, we know about, um, uh, we know about uh, Nimrod being kind of this world dictator, as has as been speculated, but he, he was never called a king, and he was never called necessarily a ruler. He was, at best, uh, you know, there's speculation that, that uh, Nimrod was a dictator, but no, no titles were given in the, those areas. First mention of war or military conflict. We haven't seen that yet. We've seen wickedness. We've seen evil. We've seen all that stuff that preceded the flood. But this is the first time we've seen war and military conflict in Scripture. It's the first mention of servitude, subjugation, or slavery in Scripture. So all these things are kind of coalescing as what the men and the people of earth are doing to, you know, r roughly 2,000 years before Christ but several hundred years after the global flood. So uh, it, life is no, you know, it, it, we don't know what life was like before the flood, the total account of all the wickedness, but obviously men at the Tower of Babel and now here in these alliances where they're putting men under um, other people's slave, enslavement rules um, and taking their possessions by war and battle and all that, obviously the earth is re once again kind of reengaging in the flesh and having no real relationship with God. All right, so Keterleomer's rule over the Jordanian kings continued for 12 years, but in the 13th year they rebelled. Um, so this was happening at, while Lot moved down there. So Lot saw the plains, moved there, maybe didn't realize that he was um, moving into occupied territory, Right, and they probably didn't have a lot of control over things or, or border guards or that kind of stuff. He moves into a plane that looks acceptable to him. He makes connections in the city of Sodom, but now realizes towards the end of this that uh, Keterleomer actually has authority over that whole region, and um, under the Mesopotamian king's rule. It lasted one year, so there's this war of rebellion that lasts a year, but then in the 14th year, Keterleomer and his allies successfully, you know, repel this, um, this uh, you know, rebellion, if you will. And so then they retake full authority over the cities of the Jordanian River, or in the, in the city-states of the Jordanian River. And so, while some of the specific details and locations of the people involved are still being discovered, okay, what we find is that through archaeology and historical references, all those names and places that I've been reading off to you, we keep getting more confirmation that these are real people, real cities, real events that were taking that all took place in Abraham's day. So what we find is like the names and locations are either specifically confirmed or at a minimum 
those names and locations are accurate to the time period. They're, they always line up with new discoveries about the ancient world. I mean, th those are the kind of names you would see 2,000 years before Christ in the Jordanian plains. Okay, that's, that's the kind of archaeological uh, support we can get that you couldn't have gotten you know, uh, uh, 50 years ago or a couple hundred years ago. We see that it all lines up very, very well. More confirmation, the Bible knows what it's saying because it's telling real history. And, and these kings and their cities that they lived in are confirmed archaeologically over and over again. Um, maybe not all yet, but probably eventually we'll, we'll get full confirmation of all of them. But we don't need confirmation because we got it right here in the Scriptures, and the Scriptures are absolutely true. All right, so this war for independence on the Jordanian side, or the war for continued dominance on the Mesopotamian side, concluded in the 14th year as all nine kings and their armies went to battle in the region of the Valley of Siddim, east of Hebron, and that's where Abram was living. Okay. So some of the Jordanian kings and warriors fell, it says, near the asphalt pits. I think that has more significant, the asphalt pits, probably has more to, uh, significance when we start talking about the actual judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, and we'll talk about that when we get there. The rest, however, the ones that weren't, didn't fall or weren't killed, were uh, fled in defeat to the mountains, and they left their territories open for continued domination by Keterleomer and his alliance with these kings. Okay. So then in victory, now they have victory over the five kings, the five city-states, and all the regions and the territories in the Jordanian plain. And so the Mesopotamian kings take all the spoils, the plunder, the conquered territories, including Sodom and Gomorrah, where Lot lived. Okay. And as we saw in the text, Lot, the nephew of Abram, was taken captive and presumably was going to be re relocated back to Mesopotamia, which is interesting because that's where Abram and Terah and Lot and the whole gang once lived. So he's going to be taken back by people that were probably, if not relatives of his, um, you know, well-known associates, if you will, in the sense of where Abram and Terah and Lot and Haran and the rest of them all lived at one point in time. Uh, however, in the midst of Lot being carried away captive one of the inhabitants of Sodom escaped and went and told Abram what had happened to his nephew, which is helpful. Okay. And we saw here another first. The first uh, use of the term Hebrew is in, used in reference to Abraham or Abram. Okay. I keep going back and forth, but Abram is the person in the text at this stage. Many believe that this uh, linked Abram's seventh generation, uh, that this, many believe that this is linked to Abram's seventh generation prior grandfather, Eber. So if you look back in the, uh, ch you know, chapter 10, chapter 11, we can count back and go, well, there was Shem, and then, you know, had a son, had a son, had a son, had a son, and his seventh uh, grandson or whatever down the line is Eber, and some people say, well, a different pronunciation of Eber is Hebrew. Heber, Hebrew, okay. But Hebrew can also mean that man from the other side of the river. And so since Abram moved from Haran on the other side of the, um, the Euphrates River, he is, you know, now he'd just be called, the, oh, he's that guy with that great big entourage of people and cattle and gold and silver, and he moved in. He's the guy from the other side of the river. We don't, you know, actually have a definitive answer as to why he's called a Hebrew, whether it's the other side of the river or associated with Eber, his great, you know, grandfather. But, um, uh, but that's, this is the first reference to the team Hebrew, and it obviously sticks as a very generic description of the Israelite people, okay? Or Abram, a Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their, and their whole family lineage, okay? But it's interesting to me, and I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, or as we've been going through this, okay, so many different religious people groups, um, ethnic groups, trace themselves back to Abraham, or Abram, whichever one you want to use at the moment. Um, but it, isn't it interesting that I don't think any Muslims, any of these Arab territories that actually claim that they, they have a link to Abraham would ever call themselves a Hebrew, Abraham is called a Hebrew. They want to say we're genetically linked to Abraham and his promises. 
But we won't call ourselves Hebrew. Why? Because it's so associated with the Jewish people. Okay. So they're, they're willing to take the sum, but they're not willing to take his actual heritage that came along with him. So I just find that interesting. I don't, think, I, I don't know. I obviously haven't interviewed anybody, but my guess is you wouldn't find an Arab any, here, there, or anywhere who would, or a Muslim anywhere who would ever say, well, yeah, I'm a Hebrew. I'm a descendant of Abraham. Okay, so presumably this escaped messenger had direct knowledge of Lot's relationship with Abram, meaning he was his, his uncle, okay? um, and then sought his help to free him. After these four kings defeated the five kings, okay, um, and so by this time Abram had also formed his own strategic alliances with some of the Canaanite, uh, you know, rulers or or influencers, um, the brother of Eshcol and Aner. So Abram has his own uh, military force, these 318 trained servants born out of his house. But then he also joins forces with other city-state kings in Canaan uh, to defeat, uh, to, to at least go off into battle with Keter Leomer. Okay. So when Abram heard, hears about Lot, he supplied arms and gave weaponry to his 318 trained servants who were born under his own household. Okay, that all just amazes me every time I say those words. 318 trained servants under his own household, and he, he weaponizes them, gives them military hardware to go out and do battle with. Um, doesn't seem like the Abraham that we saw called out of Ur of the Chaldeans or out of Haran. But anyway, that's what the text declares. So Abram was already, as stated, must have been very wealthy. Again, he's got these trained servants. They're not just servants. They're born servants under his own household. That means to me that they had a father and a mother who were also servants in Abram's household, and they got together, or at least in Terah's household, got together. They have children. Some of those children are men or boys. They grow up to men, and they become military age, and he can... That, that's a big, big, big enterprise <laughs> to me. Okay. So these 300, 318 trained servants were born to servants who lived under, uh, lived under Abram's roof or his father's roof. Um, given the fact that Abram had only been in Canaan a few years at this point, at most, these were clearly men, uh, you know, the, these were, they, they were traveling with him from Haran, and obviously they're of military age. Don't, we can't picture Abram sending eight-year-old boys into battle, right? He's sending men, 20 years old, 30 years old, whatever, into battle, not young boys. So they obviously all came with him from uh, Haran. And since none of these 318 were women, right? The women in military is a relatively recent kind of thing. So the total number of servants Abram was responsible for could have been, to me, around 1,000. You got 318 trained men able to go to war. You're going to have some women to go along with that. You might have some young children who are not of military age. And you might even have some uh, elderly men who might be considered too old to go to war. So you got to how many is that? I think 1,000 doesn't seem improbable. Could even be more. Okay. That's a lot of people Abraham is, is responsible for. Now, you also may have seen, as we read through this, there's a, a reference to Dan. And I think this is an interesting reference, and I didn't find a whole lot of um, satisfactory commentaries on this. Okay. You might recognize Dan as one of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, right? Well, Dan, if, if this is in reference to Dan, one of the tribes of Israel, this is centuries before that could possibly have happened, okay? Um, and so uh, we've, got, we've got some problems with, with call, calling it Dan, okay? So Dan is one of the tribes. He's Israel's grandson, and so no location could have been named after him in his day. And in fact, they hadn't even inherited the territory at that time because it was, uh, it was while well, Joshua, of course, I'm sorry, while well, Moses, 500 years later, is aware of Dan, the tribe, it's under Joshua, Moses' successor, that the territorial allotments are made. And therefore, you couldn't be calling it Dan. Even Moses wouldn't know if it was Dan under Joshua's allotment process without you know, prophetic foreknowledge. But we recognize that, that when Dan was born, uh, he, he was named for the condition that he, you know, his mother found him in. And so uh, the name Dan was actually 
a verb before it was a proper name. Okay? And um, the, so Dan means to quarrel or to judge or to contend. So I'm kind of drawing a conclusion here. It may be, it's not definitive, but it may be that Abram pursued his nephew Lot and Keterleomer north to a place where he contended with the king concerning Lot's release, um, which would then explain why you might call that territory Dan. Okay, uh, Maybe I'm not explaining it well, so let me try one more time. Abram gets word that his nephew Lot has been taken, and Keterleomer is en route back to Mesopotamia. He's going through the Fertile Crescent. So he's carrying Lot and his family and everybody else, all the captives, back down to Mesopotamia. Abram gets word, he gathers up all of his resources, including his, his own alliances, chases Keterleomer, finds him and says, give me my nephew Lot back. Okay. And they're contending, they're striving here in whatever region they were in over, day, over Lot. And Keterleomer says, no, you can't have him, we're going. And so it's a, called the place of, uh, of quarreling or contention. And so it wasn't named after Dan the tribe, it was named after where Abram had an encounter with Keterleomer. At, at least to me seems plausible that that's why you would refer to it, they pursued him as far as the place of contention or the place of quarreling. But that's not where the, the battle was settled. They didn't, they didn't engage in military battle there. It's, we're going to see that in just a moment. Okay, so, you know, don't freak out. I think some people will go, oh, you know, there's no way Moses could know that it was Dan because that was 600 years after, you know, or whatever, or, or after Abraham had this encounter. Um, I, I just think it's, it's probable, you know, that, uh, that it just happens to be, you know, you, what, what it, when you... <laughs> Um, when Abram offers his son Isaac, you know, he calls it, it's the mount of the Lord that shall be provided. He had a significant experience there, and he names the place where it happened. Uh, when, he, when somebody d digs a well, they dig a well, and they say it's the well. I'll give it the name of the well based on what, what was happening in my life at that very moment. So I think that's, where, that's how I settle that. Don't have to be right. That's just how I look at it. And it probably doesn't bother any of you at all, and that's fine. It's just, you know, uh, again, I just want to make sure you know, this is it's called Dan, but it can't possibly be called Dan after the son of uh, Abram's grandson, who didn't take, uh, whose people didn't inherit the territory until 600 plus years later. Um, but unless God is prophetically naming it through Abraham, which is possible, but I don't think that's the case. All right, so then with the failed release of Lot... Uh, at Dan, at this place called Dan, Abram then interestingly uses a military flanking technique to divide his forces at night, which I assume is a very uncommon strategy at this time of history. You just don't do go into battle or set yourself in battle array at night as very frequently anyway, uh, especially if you're not a trained military. And so he's using a flanking maneuver. He's got, he's got Keterleomer sort of here, and he uses flanking maneuvers to kind of come around side him with his trained servants and all that's going on there. So Abram's uh, servants then pursue from Dan, pursue Lot's captors far up to Haba, which is further north of wherever Dan is in Damascus. And I'll just mention that this is the first mention of Damascus which happens to be one of the oldest post-Babel cities known in history. Okay? Um, it's really got a long, long history in Damascus. And historians believe it was founded by one of Shem's grandsons, so it's pretty ancient, even by Abraham's time. Uh, Abram's military strategy worked. This flanking maneuver with this you know, positioning in the middle of the night, his flanking maneuver worked, and he defeated those who were holding his nephew Lot captive, uh, and some are all of the victors of the battle over the five kings. So this, I, 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 this is just amazing to me. Think about this. So you have five city-state kings who were defeated by the Keterleomer and his alliance. And here comes Abraham with whatever he can muster, and he defeats the victors as they're en route with all of their spoils of war, including their captives, he, here's Abram taking victory over the four successful kings in, after the battle of the nine kings. Now, maybe they were a little bit decimated because of the battle, who knows? But Abraham is victorious where the five kings were not victorious, uh, you know, 
weeks or months earlier. Okay. So he had a great military strategy, and it worked. So Scripture offers no account of what this battle you know, looked like, but Abraham was victorious and even captured all of the spoils of war that were being transported back to Mesopotamia, including all of the people. So you had all these captives from Mesopotamia that were being carried back to, or from the Jordan Plain city-states, carried back to Mesopotamia, all of their riches, all of their wealth, all of their goods, and Abraham defeats the, five, or the four king alliance and takes everything for his own. Not a bad day. Okay. Um, the defeated, what's that? Nice. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah, not a bad night, yeah. Um, defeated, but, uh, the, the defeated but still living king of Sodom comes out to then meet Abram in the valley of Shiva, the king's valley along the king's highway. And the king requested, uh, the king of Sodom requested to have just the people that Abraham had rescued and are now under his authority released. Uh, but he states, Abram, you keep the spoils of war, right? You know, you, you're the victor. You keep all the spoils of war, but we give our people back. We don't really, you know, do you really want our people as slaves or whatever? Um, and so he, the, this king of Sodom is just asking for his people back, not the goods. But Abraham has a different response. Abraham re, uh, raised his hand to Yahweh, the, and he calls him the possessor of heaven and earth, and indicated that uh, God was the one who gave Abram this victory. Yahweh gave me this victory. And Abram deserved no credit, and because he deserved no credit for this victory, he had no legitimate claim to any of the spoils that he had taken, or that you know, he accumulated through the victory. Okay. So he says, I would not so much as keep a sandal strap or a thread from my uh, victory here, because it wasn't mine to begin with. It was only God's victory. And it was important for Abraham to acknowledge that his wealth and his blessings did not come a result of his own efforts, but everything that he had was really a result of his blessings from God alone. Okay. Now, of course, Abraham could not, uh, could not return the food that his men had eaten, right? They're, they've taken food. They were hungry after the battle. They'd eaten food. He says, oh, look, I can't give you back what our men have eaten, but you king of Sodom, you take all of the spoils of war. I'm not interested in keeping any of that. It, you didn't make me rich. God may, has given me everything in life that I'm blessed by. Okay. So Abraham's attitude is very, very humble and, and God-honoring in that he says, I don't want anything that came from somebody else's labor. God will give me everything that I need. I trust in God for everything. And so we're seeing a man who we Earlier tonight, we're describing some of his failures. Here, we're seeing a man who was given incredible victory over his enemies and does it with such humility and grace that he wants absolutely none of the spoils or riches that would normally be associated with such a victory. He wants none of them because he's putting his faith, trust, confidence in God. Yeah. Himself up as king of that area. Oh, yeah. Five kings yep. With no problem. Yeah, he, he was. Yeah, he, he would have be the legitimate king of those Jordanian kings and could even claim to be king of the Mesopotamian kings. Yeah. He wanted none of that. He wanted to be where God called him to be. And in and, 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 and doing so, he still never had land. And, he, and, and as far as we know, he never ever had a permanent house. He always dwelt in tents all the days of his life. So that's a big choice. So, as I said, I skipped the uh, Melchizedek. We'll cover that next week. It's a great, great um, lesson to learn from Abraham encountering Melchizedek. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yep.